Good morning, church. Welcome back to the matinee. Don't forget to silence your cell phones. Friends, we're looking at the story of Jesus through the lens of some Hollywood blockbusters. So kick back, relax. I apologize. Our popcorn machine malfunctioned this morning. So just sit back, relax. We'll have popcorn next week. Today, we're going to talk about a makeover, changing our appearance to make us blend in with the rest of the world. Because life is difficult when we stand out. I mean, people notice us. They may not like us. So we do our best to look like and act like everyone else around us so that we could just blend into the crowd. We continue our matinee with Avatar. James Cameron is a Canadian filmmaker, inventor, engineer, philanthropist, and deep sea explorer. He's brought numerous films to the big screen, including hits like The Terminator, Aliens, and Titanic. Cameron successfully reached the bottom of the Mariana Trench, the deepest part of the ocean, in a vessel known as the Deep Sea Challenger, and he's the first person to ever do this in a solo descent, and is only the third person to do so ever. He's won three Academy Awards for Titanic, a movie after which he began a project that took him almost 10 years to complete, his science fiction epic, Avatar. It was a landmark for 3D technology, and in total, Cameron's directorial efforts have grossed approximately $6 billion worldwide. His two movies, Titanic and Avatar, are the two highest grossing films of all time. Avatar begins in the year 2154. Humans have depleted the Earth's resources, leading to a severe energy crisis. And the Resources Development Administration, or RDA, has discovered Pandora. And they're mining it for a valuable mineral known as unobtainium. Pandora is a densely forested, habitable moon orbiting the gas giant Polyphemus in the Alpha Centauri star system. Pandora whose atmosphere is poisonous to humans, is inhabited by the Navi, 10-foot-tall, blue-skinned humanoids who live in harmony with, nurture, with nature and worship, and they worship a mother goddess called Ewa. To explore Pandora's biosphere, scientists use Navi-human hybrids called avatars, operated by genetically matched humans. Jake Sully, a physically handicapped former Marine, replaces his deceased twin brother as the operator of one. Dr. Grace Augustine, who heads the Avatar program, considers Sully an inadequate replacement but accepts his assignment as a bodyguard. Let's take a look as Jake puts on his Avatar for the very first time. While protecting the avatars of Grace and scientist Norm Spellman as they collect biological data, Jake's avatar is attacked and he flees into the forest where he is rescued by Natiri, a female Navi. Witnessing an auspicious sign, she takes him to her clan whereupon Natiri's mother orders her daughter to initiate Jake into Navi society. Now, Colonel Miles Korich, head of the RDA's private security force, promised Jake that he would restore his legs if he gathered information about the Navi and the clan's gathering place, a giant tree called Home Tree, on grounds that it stands above the richest deposit of obtainium in the area. When Grace learns of this, she transfers herself, Jake, and Norm to an outpost. And over three months, Jake grows to sympathize with the Navi. And after he is initiated into the tribe, he and Neytiri choose one another as mates. And soon afterward, Jake reveals his change of allegiance when he attempts to disable a bulldozer that threatens to destroy a sacred Navi site. When Korich shows a video recording of Jake's attack on the bulldozer to administrator Parker Selfridge, and another in which Jake admits that the Navi will never abandon Home Tree, Selfridge orders Home Tree destroyed. Despite Grace's argument that destroying Home Tree could damage the biological neural network native to Pandora, Selfridge gives Jake and Grace one hour to convince the Navi to evacuate before the attack. While trying to warn the Navi, Jake confesses to being a spy, and the Navi take he and Grace captive. Seeing this, Korich's men destroy Home Tree, killing Natiri's father and many others. 
Natiri's mother frees Jake and Grace, but they are detached from their avatars and imprisoned by Corage's forces. To learn more of Pandora, Jake, and Grace's fate, gather up some friends. I was going to tell you to pull up Netflix, but I discovered they don't have this movie available, so there still is a red box at Cherry Grove. But spend some time together. Seriously. It's winter outside. Enjoy some movies. This morning, we simply need to focus on this idea of being able to suit up to change forms in order that we might be able to experience and fit in with the society in which we find ourselves. I mean, that's the whole reason the avatars were invented. Without them, the humans would be killed. The humans found a way to incarnate themselves as natives of Pandora, and it helped them to get what they wanted, to take back to Earth the precious resource of unobtainium. If you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to the Gospel of John chapter 1. And this gospel is written somewhere around 110, which is 70 or so years after Jesus' death and resurrection. And it's unique in that there are several instances in this text where early church theology starts peeping through that is not seen in the other gospels. John does not have a birth narrative per se, but rather talks about Jesus in words that indicate the beginning of time. These words help to frame our understanding of the doctrine of Christ and the doctrine of the Trinity. We're going to look at verses 1 through 5. Hear these words. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and without Him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in Him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. I love the way that John opens this gospel. I mean, imagine, if you would, the, the movie promo guy reading this. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Practicing for my retirement career. It's written in such a way that it promotes this epic tale to follow. The tale certainly was epic. The Gospel of John tells the story of Jesus and tells us that from the very beginning of time, Jesus was the Word. The writer tells us that the Word was there at the beginning, that the Word was God, and that the Word became flesh in Jesus Christ. From this, we come to understand that Jesus was God in human form, that he had real feelings, that he had real emotions, and he experienced life the same way you and I would. He was both God and man. He was fully human and fully divine. And we learned last week that earth was in this dark and cold winter. It was a period of exiles. There was widespread despair. Jerusalem had been decimated, and godlessness was pervasive. For those who still believed, for those who tried to live righteously, these were dark days. They felt that God was not only absent, but that nothing could be done to save the earth from the state that it was in. We learned that God had a plan, and that plan was promised to Habakkuk, who in turn promised God that he would wait. God not only delivered the Israelites, but God delivered the promise that one was coming who would bring light into the darkness, would bring peace amidst the violence. And while it did not end darkness and despair for good, God's promise and subsequent fulfillment gave us something to have hope in. And we learned that we simply need to keep watch. Where is it that God is at work? Where is God moving among us? And when we don't see that, to be patient as we wait, and to hold fast to God's promises when it seems like all hope is lost. God's message to the Israelites was a promise of restoration, and they clung to it, and we still cling to it today. God's promise can be found throughout the prophecy in the Old Testament, and I want to share a few pieces with this, uh, of this with you this morning. Now, we've got the text reference. It's going to be on the screen for you in case you want to look any of these up later. But in Isaiah 7, 14, we read, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign, Look, the young woman is with child, and she'll bear a son, and she'll name him Emmanuel. Isaiah records in chapter 9, verse 2, and verses 6 and 7, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. For a child has been born for us, 
a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 5 and 6. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. And finally, from Micah 5.2, But you, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, who are one of the little clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to rule Israel, whose origins is from old, from ancient days. From these texts we learn that a light is coming, a day will come when Israel and all of its people would be saved, and that that one will come from Bethlehem. It almost sounds too good to be true. Kind of like these prophecies would have sounded to the Israelites who were in exile. Kind of like going to another planet and finding something called unobtainium sounds to us. Was that far-fetched? And yet we read in Luke chapter 2, that Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged in expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them. In the end, the light had come. The king of kings had arrived. Jesus was God in human form, and he came to relate to us, to experience life as we experience it. He put on an avatar, if you will, so that he would look like everyone else, feel like everyone else, and understand what life on this earth was really like for us. And despite his appearance and his experience as a human, he himself was tempted, but he did not succumb to that temptation. He didn't shy away from holding other people accountable. And when the powerful and mighty questioned them, he questioned and challenged them right back. He walked the walk of a human being, but he acted differently. You see, he lived in such a way that everything he did pointed others to God rather than pointing people to the earth and those who were in control of it. He said things. Like to those who love their life on this earth will lose it. Love your neighbor. You are the salt of the earth. See, the world was full of people who loved their life in this world. And they were scared to death that they were going to lose it. So they looked after themselves. And in order to preserve life, they tried to blend in and they kept their heads down. The Avatar program was created to blend in, to gain trust, and take advantage of and exploit a group of people. By complete contrast, Jesus came and blended in. He gained trust, but then he gave of himself so that we might be set free. There are countless people in this world who are unhappy in their own skin. They don't like their physical appearance. They don't like the clothing that they can afford. They wish that they could be anyone other than themselves. To be completely honest, I've had moments when I thought like this, and I'm sure there are times we all do to some degree. We hide behind our clothes and our appearance so people can't see the real us. And if they don't like the way we appear, it just compounds things. I would argue that when we don't accept and embrace ourselves for who we are, we are denying the image of God through which we have been fearfully and wonderfully made. If we can't accept the image of God in ourselves, how could we possibly begin to accept that image in someone who is different from us or even similar to us? What kind of life are we really living if we love life so much that we would hide who we are because we are afraid of what others might think? I think that's what Jesus was getting at when he talked about losing our life. If we're too afraid to be who we were created to be, we might as well have had no life at all. Because behind the pretending exists misery, 
the life we live becomes a lie. God came incarnate not to blend in with the crowd, but to stand out and to show us how we might have life and have it abundantly. He tells us in John chapter 10, verse 10, that the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. The earthlings went to Pandora like thieves to kill and destroy. Temptation. Secular society, the media, big corporations can all come like thieves into our lives and try to get us to conform to something that we're not. But we've been given this precious gift of life. Why would we let other people or society decide what we should look like, what we should act like? We've been created to be who we are because that's when we're at our best. I know that our experiences in life, we can have some really painful moments. And those moments cause us to build up walls. And those walls become very difficult to tear down. But Jesus calls us to be salt. And he calls us to be light for a reason. Because the world needs more people who are willing to be unique. Who are willing to stand up and to step out. Because at our core, we were made to love and to be joyful. And we're at our most loving and most joy-filled when we honor the person we were created to be. Why would we ever don an avatar to hide who we are? God came as a human being to show us a new path to become one of us, to help us experience life to its fullest. Don't waste your time trying to create this false facade. Be who you are, and if people don't like that, it's on them, not you. Because God's always going to be delighting when you're living life that he created for you. When God saw that the earth was in the dead of winter, he promised that he was going to send someone to save the world from its doom, to rescue the Israelites and all people thereafter from exile, to pave the way for salvation. Jesus experienced rejection throughout his life. His message wasn't welcome among all, but he had a mission, and he stuck to it. And he had a calling of a following of people that still seeks to follow and advance his mission in the world today. Despite the rejection, he pulled no punches. Similarly, we have to ask ourselves, are we going to just live this life to blend in with the crowd? Or will we allow ourselves to be seen for who we really are? Will we stand up for the one who made us or will we conform to the world? Will we choose to be happy in our own skin or will we waste time on earth trying to be something we're not? Because in reality, this physical body It's our avatar. It's the place where our soul resides. And you've got the option to let your soul shine through it, allowing yourself to rejoice and to be happy and to worship God, for through Him, you have received the gift of life on earth. And we only get one of them to live. What are you going to do with yours? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of life, and we thank you for your son Jesus who came to teach us not to let the world take your gifts and graces from us, but rather to use them, to point the world to you. Help us to have the courage to be who we are, to step out, to step up, and to step towards you and your plan for us each and every day of our life. This we pray in the name of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And speaking about a makeover, uh, just a reminder that our renovations in this space continue this week. We begin our flooring project. Uh, So know that over the next couple of weeks or so, you may come in and half the room will look different than the other, but rest assured, the whole project will be done and it's going to look great when we're finished. My friends, Jesus came on this earth to dance and to show us what life was really supposed to be about. I have, as a pastor, a number of times been asked by someone, what is God's will for my life? And yes, God's will may pertain to a certain career or vocation or or track, but the number one thing that is God's will for us is simply that we follow Him, that we worship Him. And my friends, we do that best when we be who God created us to be. May God the Father, may God the Son, may God the Holy Spirit be with you. Be you. We'll see you next week.